I uh, want to uh, welcome our second panel and first off apologize to the panel that the first panel took so long, um, but I thought it was worthy of a, a lengthy discussion. I uh, hope you all do as well. Uh, let me, by uh, way of uh, introduction, uh, introduce our panel. Uh, Mr. Uh, Dubowitz is the Executive Director of the Foundation of Defense of Democracies. Uh, Mr. Rubin is a resident scholar at the American uh, Enterprise Institute, AEI. Uh, Mr. Lorber is the Senior Associate at uh, the Financial Integrity Network. And Ms. Maloney is the Deputy Director of Foreign Policy and a Senior Fellow for Middle East Policy, Energy Security, and Climate Initiatives at the Brookings uh, Institute. Each uh, of the four of you will be recognized for uh, five minutes to give us an oral presentation of your testimony. Without objection, uh, the witness's written testimony will be made a part of our record. Uh, once the witnesses have finished their testimony, each member of the subcommittee will have an opportunity to uh, ask each of you questions for a period of five minutes. Uh, again, you probably all know this, but on your table you have your three lights. Uh, green is go, yellow is you have a minute left, and red is uh, your time is up. Please make sure you uh, put your uh, microphone on when you speak. Uh, I would just note that um, I, the, the uh, Democrats know we're doing this second panel. Uh, we may get some more of them back in the room uh, as we proceed, but they know we're going to proceed without any of them here. Uh, with that, Mr. Uh, Dubowitz, you are recognized for five minutes. Great. Th well, thank you, Chairman Duffy and Vice Chairman Fitzpatrick, uh, Ranking Member Green, and uh, Congressman Hill distinguished members of the subcommittee. On behalf of FDD and its Center on Sanctions Illicit Finance, it's an honor to testify today. And we've talked about Iran's malign activities, and they pose a severe threat to U.S. national security. These activities include support for terror groups, Shiite militias, proxy forces, and rogue states. Now, as has been discussed today, to expand these illicit activities, the regime needs cash because it's liquid, it's untraceable, it's convertible, and it's easy to transfer. And according to the Financial Action Task Force, cross-border ca cash transfers are one of the main methods used to move illicit funds, launder money, and finance terrorism. Now, instead of focusing my testimony only on the question of whether the $1.7 billion was a ransom, I want to broaden the inquiry. The key question I want to ask today, which is best illustrated in the handout that you have before uh, you, as well as on the screen, is did Iran, in fact, get tens of billions of dollars of cash, maybe up to $33.6 billion? So let's start with this. President Obama has said, quote, the reason that we had to give them cash is precisely because we are so strict in maintaining sanctions. We could not wire the money. Well, as we've discussed, legally the president is wrong. The existing regulations permit transactions. The president may also use his special authority under IEPA to authorize banks to facilitate these transactions. In short, there are no legal barriers. The tribunal has settled about 4,000 claims. I, I find it hard to believe they were all done in cash. Now, it's certainly possible that banks were unwilling to not wire the funds, no matter what guarantees they got, because they have a healthy fear of sanctions after so many years. But if so, it raises a troubling question. How did Iran receive the billions of dollars in sanctions relief under the JPOA and JCPOA? Now, during the JPOA negotiations, we know that Iran was granted $700 million a month, or $11.9 billion, from its restricted overseas oil escrow accounts. If no mechanism existed to transfer the tribunal funds for the formal financial system, what mechanism was used to transfer the $11.9 billion? Now, a senior official has admitted to the Wall Street Journal that, quote, some of that money was sent in cash, and that, quote, we had to find all these strange ways of delivering the monthly allotment. Well, what exactly were these strange ways? Did they include cash or gold, other precious metals, or was there a formal financial channel? Now, it doesn't end there. In July, U.S. officials estimated that Iran had repatriated quote, less than 20 billion from previously frozen overseas assets of 100 to 125 billion dollars. Were those funds also repatriated in cash and gold? Was this an addition to the 11.9 billion dollars or inclusive? If the White House could only send cash to Iran from the start of the JPOA period through the tribunal payment, that could amount to a grand total of 33.6 billion dollars. Did any of this money go through the formal financial system? If so, the administration is not being truthful about the $1.7 billion. If many billions of dollars arrived in Iran on pallets, this would be a pretty astounding revelation. Now to the question of ransom. If Iran was able to receive some or all of the sanctions relief through the formal financial system, why was the $1.7 billion paid in cash? 
Now, for example, in February 2014, the Bank of Japan reportedly wired $550 million to an Iranian central bank account in Switzerland as part of the interim agreement. There's no reason that the administration couldn't have wired the $1.7 billion immediately to that same account rather than sending cash. So perhaps Iran simply wanted cash. As one senior official said to the Wall Street Journal, quote, sometimes the Iranians want cash because it's so hard for them to access things in the international financial system. Now, is this an admission that cash was an Iranian demand and not a logistical impossibility? The 400 million cash delivery in January is part of a tightly scripted exchange timed to the release of the American hostages. If Washington needed Iran to receive the funds immediately in order to keep to the script, was cash the only way, or could they have wire transferred that money immediately to the same central bank of Iran account at the Swiss, Swiss central bank? Now, the administration calls it leverage, but Iranian officials call it a ransom, and it's really that Iranian opinion that I think matters. This might explain one of the reasons why the IRGC has arrested more Americans and other dual nationals to cash in again. So let me conclude by summarizing my concerns with these two key questions. Number one, did the administration authorize the cross-border transfer of, of as much as $36 billion in cash and perhaps gold, or some portion thereof? If so, the White House provided the Iran with unprecedented and untraceable funds to fuel Iranian regime terror and other nefarious activities. Or question two, if the administration never before authorized the transfer of cash and gold to Iran, did they send this $1.7 billion as a unique cash delivery to satisfy Iranian demands? And did they do this because it was the only way to get our hostages back? Well, this, this suggests ransom. It just seems to me that the administration can't have it both ways. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Rubin.